<clears throat> Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. I'm out here with my dear brother Brett, who's also a pastor, and my friend John, who's also a former pastor. And uh, we come out here, my friends, to bring to you the good news of Jesus Christ, to preach to you the gospel message. Friends, we come here to, to warn you, to warn you about the coming wrath, God's judgment that is coming upon the world and coming upon the wicked, but to say that God has prepared the ark of salvation. He has prepared the way of salvation, and He has revealed it to be His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He Himself said in, in, in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6, He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Me. My friends, we're out here to tell you in the words of the apostles in Acts 4.12, there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. We're out here to, to speak to you in the words of the apostle Paul in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. We're here to tell you that your righteousness, your what you suppose to be righteousness before God is not enough, that your good deeds cannot save you. That you've sinned against God. You have, you have brought about your utter condemnation by your sin. You have invoked His hatred upon you. But the love that God has manifested in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is so great and so life-changing and so liberating. As Paul even said in Romans 5, he said, But God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. At the cross, Jesus Christ propitiated. He satisfied God's wrath against sin. And He was raised. He was raised from the grave on the third day. And my friends, Christ is seated now in heaven. And He is exalted there in heaven. At the right hand of the throne of God, there being praised by the angels in glory. And my friends, we come out here for that reason, to tell you about this Christ and this Savior and this Lord and this King. For there is no other way for you to be saved from your sins outside of the Lord Jesus Christ's saving grace. And above that even, we are here to bring God glory. We're here to bring the God who has redeemed our souls honor and exaltation. The Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of praise and He is worthy of, of adoration. He is worthy of being worshipped as the Creator God. He is worthy of that, dear friends. And so we're here to lift Him up and to praise Him. And this is an act of worship. Bringing Christ's glory through open air preaching. It's an act of worship to our God and Savior, Christ Jesus, the Lord. And so friends, the text of Scripture I would like to direct your attention to this evening, I would like to show you, is in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, hey brother John, in a moment, whenever you get a chance, can you walk across there and tell me how it sounds across the way? Just when you get a chance, I want to be sure that my volume is adjusted. Thank you very much. I can run a test real quick. Testing, testing, testing. Before I do show you this text of Scripture, I just want to be sure my volume is the right... Turn it up a little bit. Can you hear me? Hear me now? Hear me now? Is that good? Brett, can you hear me back there? Okay. Alright, thank you. <clears throat> the text of Scripture I would like to turn your attention to is in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 24 verse 24 and we're going to look at verse 25 the apostle paul writes these words he says therefore god gave them over to in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them for they exchanged the truth of god for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever amen oh my friends there is a a point in which god as he looks upon the children of men and he sees their rebellious hearts and he sees that they've rejected him and that they have turned away from him, that altogether have, they have become useless, God eventually gives them over to the things which they so desire. God eventually lets them up to that which they so want 
Jesus himself said in, in John 6 that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. People cannot come to the Lord Jesus Christ because they will not come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there comes a time and a, a point in which their rejection of Christ is solidified. There is further hardness added to their hardened hearts. And God lets them go to that which they so desire. Dear friends, we're here trusting that you have not come to that point. And we trust that in the mercy of God, He has brought us here this very evening, that in the sovereign grace of God, He has brought us here to preach the gospel and to soften hearts, to preach the message which can soften your hard hearts. God bless you, sir. Bless you. Oh, I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You just sit right there. Thank you. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely. Praise God for His creation. Fruit nourishes the... <clears throat> Friends, there is a point in which God does that to both individuals and even corporately as, our, as a nation. And that's, that's what we find right now ourselves in. We find ourselves in a culture which has been turned over to that which it chases after and desires so greatly. But friends, God in His mercy and in His grace has a remnant. He has an elect people that He is, he is going to save. And He is going to call unto Himself. And He does it through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He does it through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the, the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel that brings sinners to reconciliation with their Creator. And so we trust, my friends, we trust that God will bring those whom He wills to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the message of the Gospel of Jesus Christ this very evening. But nonetheless, as it stands, if there is rejection of Christ and there is, there is a hardening of hearts within men and they turn and they turn and they turn and they do not turn to the Lord God but they continue to turn to their sin, then they will eventually be led up they will, they will be released to do that, that which they so desire. And friends, we do not want that for you. For it is a, is a horrible state to be left in. To be utterly let to do with that which you so desire to do. My friends, here is a great mystery. That God is, is restraining the evil of men's hearts every day. God is holding back the wickedness which men would otherwise do. God is restraining evil and praise Him for that. Otherwise, who knows the chaos that would ensue in our world today. But friends, oh my friends, there might come a time for you when you pursue that which displeases the Most High and that which is in contradiction to His holy character. And He therefore will give you up to it. To a reprobate mind. And friends, we do not want that for you. We come out here out of love, love for our fellow man and love for the Creator God most importantly. Love for the God of glory, the God of Scripture. And so may He be honored as the message of the Gospel is preached. Now just to note, before we look at these two, pet, these two texts of Scripture, I want us to consider and recall the context of Romans 1. Paul has, in verses 16 and 17, established that the book of Romans is an exposition of the gospel message. It is the, the truth, the, the, the cardinal point of the Christian faith. It's the heartbeat of the Christian is the gospel message. And so he begins by saying, this is what I'm going to spend the rest of the book unpacking. But before he does that, he wants to give the bad news. He wants to bring the bad news of God's, of God's judgment against sin, God's hatred of sin, the reality of hell. He wants to bring those truths to light before he begins explaining the gospel message. My friends, in order for you to understand the grace of God, you must see the wrath of God. In order for you to see the mercy and love of God, you must see the justice and holiness of God. In order for you to grasp the depth of the good news of Jesus Christ, you must see your sin as it is. You must see how holy God is and how much He hates the sin and the sinner. And you must see His wrath that is revealed from heaven. And that is why the Apostle Paul first begins in verse 18 
by saying these words, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Friends, he begins with the bad news before he brings the good news. And we know the good news comes onto the scene in this book in chapter 3 and 4 and 5 and it ensues in the, in the next few chapters. He enumerates the implications of the good news. God bless you, ma'am. The good news of Jesus Christ but the bad news must come first. And so I want to, in like manner, do that in this sermon. First explain the bad news and then bring the good. But let us look in verse 24 and 25. And this is, you could say, the releasing unto idolatry. God releases man. He lets him, he lets him up to do that which he so desires. And that is to worship idols. As it says in verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. Notice firstly he says God. Dear friends, God is the sovereign agent in salvation. God is the one who is, who is ultimately bringing all things to pass for His own glory. And so it is the sovereign God that I, I call upon you to give glory to. Because He is sovereign over salvation. And He's even sovereign over this aspect of salvation, that is reprobation, bringing people, or allowing them, I should say, to do that which they so desire. And so He says, Therefore God gave them over. And that is the key phrase there, gave them over. Oh, how I, we, pr we cry out to God in prayer for sinners like yourselves that God might not do this. That He might instead treat you how you do not deserve to be treated and might pour out the riches of His grace as He has done unto us. As He has saved us, we so desire that He would save you from your sins. In fact, my friends, I say this. Be reconciled to God. Cry out to the God of glory. Cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans, or excuse me, the, the book of Acts 2.20 says, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved from their sin. But nonetheless, the text reads, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts. My friends, your heart is chasing after something. You are created to worship. The seed of religion is within you. And what I mean by that is that you have been created to worship. God has made you in His image to bear His image. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. As the Westminster Shorter Catechism question 1 says, That's the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We are created to worship. But what happened was in the fall, when we look back in Genesis, Adam fell. Adam sinned against God. He ate the forbidden fruit. And so even though he was created to worship God, he entered into a state of fallenness and therefore he could not any longer worship God in and of himself. He had become totally depraved. He had become dead into sin. We had all fallen in Adam. We find ourselves, my friends, today dead in Adam outside of Christ's salvation. He in that garden represented the entirety of the human race and he fell. And so we are born into those benefits. I, I don't know if I could call them benefits. The results of his choice. His choice to sin against God and to rebel against Him. And therefore, and therefore, we are born into this totally depraved state. This state of deadness to sin. And so my friends, because of that you, even you yourselves who are unconverted, unsaved, you are in a state of deadness to sin and you do worship even if you're a pagan you say well I, I don't believe in any religion I don't believe in, in any God or anything of that sort you still worship you still worship something there are, there's a whole plethora of things which men find themselves worshipping 
whether it be cars or money or success, whether it be relationships or marriage, whatever it might be, whatever it might be. You can actually tie it to this, brother, too, like a little strap okay, right yeah, here. Thank you. Yep. It don't have to be super tight. It's just so someone steals them, they'll, it'd be much harder to steal them. Anyways. And so, my friends, that seed of religion is found with each and every one of us. And because of our fallenness, we no longer worship God, but we are in a state of worshiping iniquity, worshiping wickedness, rebelling against the Creator who made us. In fact, a few verses later here in Romans 1, listen to the way Paul describes fallen humanity. Verse 28, he says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind and to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, uh, uh, um, excuse me, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unlovable, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That's the state of sinful man before God. He does not worship God. He cannot and He will not worship His Creator. And that is why the text reads, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. That is that which is not pure. See, God in Himself intrinsically is pure and righteous and holy. And so sin is that which is in contradiction to the character and perfection of God's being. It is that which contradicts who He is. It is that which goes against His creative order. That is sin. And so, that is what is meant by the, by the word here, impurity. That which is against the purity that God possesses intrinsically. That is why one of the purposes of our coming out here is to exalt the God of purity. The God who is so glorious, who is clothed in majesty and wonder. He is the God of all grace. The book of James says He's the Father of lights. And He is the God who is imminent. He is the God who is near. He is not far from each one of us. And that is why, as I quoted just a few minutes ago, the text out of Acts, which says, Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But going back to the text in verse 24, it says, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Listen to the results, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And that is an interesting phrase, but it speaks to the fact that sin, sin is against not only the character of God, but as I said just a few moments ago, it is against God's creative order. God bless you, ladies. And that is why as a nation, corporately, we find ourselves in this gender hysteria or this confusion about genders and homosexuality and the sexual revolution as a whole. I'm not here just to bash on homosexuality. This is about any pervert, any sexual perversion is an abomination in God's eyes. It's against God's creative order. And that's why it says their bodies would be dishonored among them. It's against the way God has created them to be. For God Himself is not the author of evil. He is not. So that their, But the text says, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. But listen to verse 25. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. My friends, God has revealed Himself in a general sense to all His creation, all of the people in the world know the God of glory. They do not only 
find themselves in a place where they know that there is a God, but they know who He is. He is the one true God of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of glory, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul wrote earlier, in verse 19 he says, Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And so that's the state in which people find themselves when they reject the notion of there being a, a higher Creator. Well, not just that, but when they reject the God of Scripture, they're reduced to absurdity. That's why I say, when I come out to preach, I say, I'm an atheist. In other words, I do not believe there is such thing as an atheist or someone who is ignorant of their Creator. Because the text of Scripture reads that God has made Himself evident to them. But they reject Him in their unrighteousness. They suppress that truth in their unrighteousness because of their guilt and their sin before God. Instead of being saved from their sin through Jesus Christ, instead of being reconciled, they reject and they turn away. And so God eventually gives them up to that which they so desire to do. But it says, as, as I said in verse 25, for they exchange the truth of God for a lie. People are living, if you're outside of Christ, friends, and I, the, the one who cares for you, the, the, the person who speaks the most truth to you is the one who loves you the most. The one who's going to tell you the most truth, even if it hurts you. And so I'd rather injure you with the truth than comfort you with lies. Because I know in the long run, in the end, the truth will benefit you. Hearing the truth will. So here's the truth, my friends. If you're outside of Christ, you're living a lie. You're, you're pursuing the lie of sin because the sin has, has promises with it. Sin has promises with it. All sin promises things. Pleasure, prosperity, prominence, peace, whatever P word you want to throw in. It, it, it promises things, but it never delivers on its promises. So when someone is living a life of sin, they're engaging in rebellion against God. They are living a lie. They're living, pursuing lies. That's why living outside of Christ is such a vain pursuit. I know that I'm young, but I stand on the authority of God's Word when I say this, that it doesn't matter how long you've lived or whatever you pursued in your life, if it's not Christ, it's vanity. If you're not living to the end that God might be glorified in you, and you're not living for the chief pursuit of knowing Christ, you're living for a lie, you're living for vanity. But not only do I stand on the authority of Scripture when I say this, but even the testimony of countless men, countless women who have who have been privileged enough in their lives to succeed in things. Rich, famous, they have power. And they all, many of them at least, will testify that it's vain and it's useless. And those who may not agree with that statement eventually will because it is vanity. All is vanity. Oh my friends, this life is so vain and the pursuits of this world are so vain. Seek after the higher things. Seek after the eternal things, the weighty things. Seek after the glory of Jesus Christ. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Do not be trampled underfoot. Of, don't be trampled under God's wrath, my friends, when it comes. Be found safe in the arms of Jesus on the day of wrath, or you will be punished by Him. But going to the text once more, it says, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Notice the beginning part there. He says two things. Two things mark the reprobate mind. Two things mark the sinful person who is outside of Christ. First and foremost, it is worship. Secondly, it is service. Firstly, it is worship. And secondly, it is service. Let's look at the first one. Worship. As I've already said, and so I won't spend too much time on this point. Men... All of mankind is created to worship, to worship God. But in the fall, 
sin corrupted the human race and so people are dead in sin and now instead of worshiping God they worship sin and they worship themselves they worship their pleasures and their lusts and therefore incur God's judgment against sin and so let's look at the second point which is something I want to labor more over and spend more time paying attention to it says they worshiped and they served the creature rather than the creator dear friends you are right now at this very moment you are a slave to something you are a slave to something you're 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 chained up to something but the question is what is it are you a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Apostles called themselves as Paul called himself are you a slave of Christ or are you a slave of sin? That's the question. That's the ultimate question. Am I the slave to sin or am I a slave to Christ? Oh, dear friends, and I call you that because it's an endearing term and I see you as dear. I care for you enough to tell you this. Become a slave of Christ because when you are... And here's an amazing paradox about being a slave of Christ. When you are a slave of Christ, then you are most free. When you're a slave of righteousness, you are most free. When I think back to the time before I was a, a convert to Christ, I was saved by the grace of God. I was a slave to sin. I just could not help but live in sin and live in rebellion. But by God's grace, He raised me to spiritual life and I became a slave to Christ and therefore I could say no to sin and I could say no to temptation. I could say no to a life of rebellion against my Creator. And said I could live in righteousness and holiness. Not perfection. I'm not claiming to be perfect. But new direction. New life direction. There is no neutrality with the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, there is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. You are either for Him or you're against Him. You're either the friend or the enemy of God. You're either the child of the, of the Most High God or you're the child of the devil. And the only way you can come from being one to the other, becoming, going from being a child of the devil to a child of God, being adopted into the family of God, is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As it says in Romans 5, 9, much more than having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. It is by the blood of Jesus Christ we are saved. Nothing else has been so pleasing to God's wrath. Nothing else can propitiate. Nothing else can, can do away with God's wrath against sin. Nothing else but the, the precious soul cleansing uh, blood of the Lamb. And so that is why the text says they worshipped and they served the creature rather than the Creator. And it says who is blessed forever. Amen. Indeed, this is ultimately, as I said earlier, this is an act of worship to God. This is an act of blessing God. We want to bless the Creator through the preaching of His Gospel. Through the lifting up of His Son and His finished work at the cross. And so who is this Creator? We ask ourselves. Because we look at this text and we say, it says He is blessed forever. He is blessed forever. In other words, the Apostle Paul is coming to a state of, in, this mo in this text here. At that moment, he is in a, in, a, in a state of reverential worship. He's saying, God, He is blessed forever. Amen. Who is this God of, wh of whom Paul speaks? Who is this God of whom Paul writes? He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of glory. He is the Holy One. My friends, God is not the way that, that inherently people think Him to be. He is different. He is set apart. In fact, God is described time and time again in the Scripture, specifically the book of Leviticus. He is described as holy. As a holy holy and holy God and that means that he is sanctified he is set apart from that which is evil and that which is wicked evil and wickedness cannot dwell in God's presence he is perfect impurity 
Scripture describes Him time and time again as light. And in Him there is no darkness. And in His presence there is no wickedness. And in His presence there is no evil. He is the de very definition of that which is lovely. And that which is beautiful. And that which is wonderful. That which is majestic. He is the, the definition. He's the objective standard of those things. He is, as the book of 1 John tells us, He is love personified. God is love. Scripture describes Him as the gracious God, the God of all mercies. He says He is abounding in loving kindness. But then it says in that very text, He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He's a holy and just God. He must punish the sin of the evildoer. He must. He cannot look over sin. He's self-sufficient as well. To add on to the listing of attributes, He is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anybody else. He doesn't need anything else. He is sufficiently fulfilled within Himself. In fact, it's an error to say something like, well, God created man because He is lonely and He wanted some friends. That's just ridiculous. No, God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything. He created man to bring glory to His name and to accomplish His greater and higher purposes of doing that. God is self-sufficient. As the text reads in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. God is the one who is from everlasting to everlasting. He exists outside of the realm of time, so He is therefore the constant I am, the constantly existent God. And that's, that's glorious to consider that fact. And wonderful and majestic to behold the beauty of God. But God has not only just enumerated His attributes and just listed them out for us in His Word, but He has put on display His holiness. He has set it forth in His law. The law of God is perfect. The law of God is pure. God has given His law for the children of men to obey, and it is a reflection of His perfect character, His perfect person. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in the same, cha in the same book, the book of Romans, verse, uh, verse 12, he says, So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. That is the nature of God's law, that it is perfect. It is holy. It is pure. There is nothing wrong in it. In fact, it is true that we are not saved by keeping the law, but God's law is a reflection of His character, and it shows us our need for the Savior. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3, he says the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. The law shows us we cannot be saved by our merits. It shows us we cannot live up to the, the perfect, objective standard of God's holiness. It shows us we deserve His wrath. We deserve to be objects of His eternal hatred. Yet in His mercy, He reveals further than that His love in Christ and His grace in Christ. But let's look at a couple of those commandments to just simply consider how does God actually reveal His character and His law. Well, one of the commands, you shall not lie, which is oftentimes spoken of, especially when parents speak to their children and say, remember God says you shall not lie. The book of Hebrews tells us God cannot, it is impossible for God to lie. He has no capacity to, to contradict His truth. That's a great assurance to anyone who puts their trust in the Most High. But the law of God, thats a, why does God tell us not to lie? Because He's not a liar. Another command, God says you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not be unfaithful to your spouse. Why? Because God is a perfectly faithful, covenant-keeping God. Another one, God said you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because God is the absolute definition of love. God says you shall not steal. Why? Because He's not a thief. We could go on and on and on. But my friends, I want you to understand God's law is just not some codes He came up with. Just arbitrarily. It is a reflection of His perfection. It's a reflection of who He 
is. And so when you break God's law, when you rebel against God, you are doing something much greater than simply breaking a command. You are grieving and contradicting and robbing glory from God. You are, you are not glorifying. You're dishonoring God when you disobey His law. How many of you have lied? Well, I know I have. How many of you have stolen? How many of you have committed adultery? You say, well, listen, I've never in my life committed adultery. You say, I've always been faithful to my spouse or my boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. Whatever you might call them. But Jesus said these words in Matthew 5. He says in verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Listen to what he says in verse 29. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jesus tells us something about God here that is terrifying. It's a terrifying reality. And that is this. God sees your thoughts and He sees your heart. That's a terrifying thought. You know, throw away this theology that Disney portrays. You know, follow your heart. That's garbage. Because your heart is depraved. Your heart is wicked. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Who can understand the wickedness of a man's heart? And so that is, the law goes further than just outward conformity. It's about inward conformity to the character of God. God bless you, ladies. Would you guys like a gospel track? This is what does the Bible say about astronomy? We have the solar eclipse coming up just a couple weeks, or not even two weeks, less than two weeks. So you, absolutely, wow, it's gonna be close. Y'all have a blessed evening. God bless you guys. But, <coughs> but friends, um, as I was saying, God's God's law shows us that about His His perfect character. It shows us who He is. And so, um, in inward conformity, uh, that, that's where I was at. Okay, inward conformity. I lost my place there. My friends, God sees you. And let me ask you this. Let me ask you. What if scientists could develop a headset, put it on the top of your head, and it could read your, your, your thoughts, it could read your mind for about two hours, and then it could display it in HD, because we live in 2017. It, it could display in HD on a huge television set. Your family and your friends would watch it for two hours, two hours of your thought life put on display. How embarrassed would you be, friends? You'd be very embarrassed. Your heart, my friends, your mind is depraved. You're wicked. Don't think yourself to be good. Don't think yourself to be righteous. What did Jesus say? He said, Blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. The Bible says God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to those who think that they have inherent righteousness. And so we've broken the law. That's very clear. And I could go on and look at other commands. God said you shall not covet. Our whole American society is built on covetousness. Every, the whole advertising system in this nation. Covetousness. Another law, and this is one that um, this text covers very clearly. That's, that's idolatry. Worshipping anything else rather than the creation. Or rather than the creator God. Excuse me. Rather than the creator God. Wow, dear friends, how we all commit idolatry. How we all commit idolatry. We put, we put things above, above, above God all the time. All the time do we do that. And so what is the punishment for sin? What is the punishment for rebellion? What is the punishment? We have to consider what does the Bible say? Well, going back to Matthew 5, what did Jesus say? It is better for you to lose one of your eyes than what? At the last part, than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. The Greek word he uses there is Gehenna. Or it's, it's actually taken from two Hebrew words, um, Ge and Hinnom. And that was the term for a, a, a valley in Jerusalem. In, the, in ancient days, in Jesus' day, they had a valley... And it was called Gin Hinnom, and it was it was outside the city of Jerusalem. And what the people would do is they would take their trash and they would take anything that they thought, leftover food, whatever, they dump it into this valley and they would have a continually burning fire there. They would throw dead bodies there. So it, it smelled of rotten flesh and burning human flesh. It was a it was a disgusting place, and it was always constantly burning, and they would go and churn it and throw more stuff into it. It was considered a cursed place. And so Jesus here uses the term to describe hell. That is what hell is. It is an eternal torment. It is an eternal flame. It is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said, 
that the fire is never quenched in hell. And friends, I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to go. We're on the precipice of eternity. We are on the, the cliff of eternity. And every day, 150,000 people step over that cliff and they stand before their Creator God. And the Bible says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God is a holy and just God and He judges men off of His law. And no one on the day of judgment can be found innocent apart from Christ. Friends, if God were to judge you based off of His law this very night, you'd be thrown into the pit of hell. You would burn there for eternity. I surely do not want this for you. And you're without hope because do not think that you can bribe God with good deeds or performance or religiosity. Don't think that you can do something to bribe God, to persuade God to let you into heaven. No good deeds will suffice. That is like, my friends, a convicted murderer here in downtown Greenville saying to a judge, Judge, listen, I've, I've helped an old woman cross the street this week. I promise to never murder again. I've given to the Red Cross. I've helped at a homeless shelter. I'm good, right? Wrong. Doesn't matter how much good you do, my friends, your guilt before God cannot be removed by your good deeds. It does not work like that. Doesn't matter how many layers of righteousness you pile on top, there is always that layer of sin and filth and iniquity that covers you. And so you are truly, fully, and completely without hope. In fact, I could just go home now if it weren't for Christ. This would be the end of the sermon if it wasn't for Christ. But I praise God that this is not the end of the sermon. This is not the end of the message, but this actually is the beginning of it. This inaugurates the gospel truth. Here is the gospel. Here is what the Bible calls the good news, the euangelion. This is the heart of the Christian faith. And there is nothing else like it anywhere in the world. And the Word of God is where this is derived from. Here is the Gospel, Galatians 4.4. But when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son. Born of a virgin, born under the law, God Almighty, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Word, the eternal Son, decides in eternity past that He is going to come into space-time and He is going to take upon Himself a fleshly tabernacle. He is going to become flesh. John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, comes and He does something glorious. He does something amazing, friends. And He did something which you cannot do, which I cannot do, which no man can do, and that is He fulfilled the law that we broke. Matthew 5.17, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Matthew 3 says, I come to fulfill all righteousness. Who can say that they can do that? In fact, there's a lot of cults out there. There's a lot of errant belief systems out there. And a lot of them say, well, Jesus, He wasn't God. He was just this prophet. Or Jesus was a teacher. Or Jesus was just the Son of God. He wasn't actually Almighty Creator. He wasn't actually the second person of the Trinity. My friends, who can say the things He said without being Almighty God? What man can say that? What man can say, I am going to fulfill this law and He did it? What man can raise the dead as Jesus did? What man could perform the miracles that Jesus did? Feed 5,000. Heal the paralytic. Make the blind see. Forgive sin. In Mark 2, He forgave sin. Who can forgive sin but God alone? That's exactly what the Pharisee said. After he did that, the Pharisee said, Who can forgive sin but God alone? They realized, even his enemies realized at that moment, he was claiming to be Almighty God. John 8, 58, Jesus said to the Israelites, Before Abraham was born, I am. Ego a me. I am. And he goes back to, Genesis, uh, to Exodus 3, where God appears to Moses in the burning bush, and he says, I am. Christ was saying, I am that God who appeared to Moses in that bush, and I am here in human flesh 
My friends, this is a glorious truth because every other religion, what do they say? What does every religion in the world say? Okay, try your best to work your way up to God. Go ahead and start building layer upon layer, brick upon brick, and try to make your own Tower of Babel up to God and see if you can do it. And what does biblical Christianity say? What does a true religion say? It says, God comes down. God steps down. God takes a quantum leap. He condescends. And He dwells among sinful men. That, that's astounding. That, that just shows the humility of Christ, the grace of Christ. Listen to the words of Philippians 2. This is amazing the way Paul describes it in Philippians 2. The humility of Christ. He says in verse 5, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, in other words, what he's saying is he was equal with the Father and he did not hold on to that. He let that go. He laid aside his privileges as the Almighty and he says, verse 7, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bond servant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him every name which is above excuse me I bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father Christ comes and he is obedient to the point of death and that is what leads me to the next part Christ lays himself down. Jesus told his disciples the night before he was crucified, no greater love has any man than this than one laid down his life for his friends. He was beaten, he was whipped, he was mocked. He was scourged, he was spat upon, he was betrayed by his, by his even one of his own disciples. He was abandoned by the rest of them. He was uh, given up into the hands of sinful men and they took him to the place of Golgotha, which was the place of the skull, and they nailed him to a cross there. Those three nails, the, the thrice-fold thrice um, excuse me, declaration of the triune God's love for sinful humanity. That shows us the grace of God, dear friends, and the mercy of God that he would hold back his wrath and set of crushing us, he'd crush his son. But it shows us God's holiness. Listen, friends, if you only look at the cross of Jesus Christ and all you take away from it is that God is nice to sinful people, you've only taken away part of the truth. You need to see something else at the cross of Jesus Christ. And that is that God does not sweep sin under the rug. He cannot. He cannot sweep sin under the rug. What would we think of a judge here in Greenville who just led convicted pedophiles and convicted murderers and convicted bank robbers off the hook arbitrarily without any judgment, without any punishment, without any retribution? People would cry out, get that judge off the bench because he's worse than the people he let off. People would say, that judge is worse than the people he let off the hook. He's taking place in their wickedness. And yet people think, people blaspheme God so as to think that on the day of judgment, He's going to sweep their sin under the rug. They think God's mercy negates His holiness. They think God's love negates His wrath. But my friends, that is so false. So false. God is a holy God and that shows us, it shows itself gloriously in the cross of Jesus Christ. So at that cross, something happened. Something happened that is wonderful. And you must understand this. At the cross of Jesus Christ, He underwent the wrath of Almighty God. That is, that the full fury of God's hatred against sin and His holy zeal for judgment was unleashed upon His Son. You don't realize this, friends. Every day, what is God doing? He is holding back His wrath. There is a dam that is holding back the flood of God's wrath. And the cross, do you know what that is? It is a breaking that dam open. And the full flood of God's infinite wrath is poured out on His Son. And He absorbs every drop of it. Christ drinks the cup of God's wrath. What does He cry out in the garden? Jesus, before He is crucified, He's praying in the garden. And before He goes to the cross, and what does He say in the garden? He says, if this is your will, Father, take this cup from me. What was He talking about? Was He talking about some nails? Was He talking about some beatings on His back? 
No, there's so much more what was happening at the cross, my friend. Isaiah 53:10, or excuse me, Isaiah 53, uh, verse verse 12 says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, Christ's soul was in anguish because he's he's undergoing God's wrath against sin. And in those few hours on that cross, it's paid for in full. Isaiah 53.10 But it pleased Yahweh to crush Him, putting Him to grief. The cross of Jesus Christ shows us the great extent to which God goes to save His people. Do you want to talk about love? Do you want to talk about mercy? Do you want to talk about grace? Don't talk about it apart from the cross of Jesus Christ. For it is nowhere greater shown than at the cross of Christ. Listen to Isaiah 53. This is written 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years. So his grandparents weren't even a a thought. They weren't even conceived. Jesus' great, great, great grandparents. Listen to what Isaiah 53 says. Verse 4, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves have seen Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to His own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. And then verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Christ died to put the guilt of sinful men away once for all. He died for his bride, the church. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is the cross of Jesus Christ. But my friends, I can tell you this. Not only was Christ crucified and not only was Christ killed, but He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. He was raised by the power of God as the the public display, the public declaration that God had accepted the sacrifice of His Son, that it was pleasing, it was a fragrant aroma in the, the nostrils of the Creator, that God was pleased to crush him. My friends, you must understand something. In the Old Testament, God instituted a system of animal sacrifice. And we know from the book of Hebrews that animals cannot take away sin. The blood of animals cannot take away sin. But the the system in which God had the Israelites uh, um, doing those sacrifices and, and offering up those sacrifices daily was to show that there was a coming lamb. It was a foreshadowing. It was pointing, saying, He's coming, He's coming, He's coming. The whole temple, the whole priestly service was all pointing to Christ. But in the Old Testament, God, if the Israelites did not offer up the sacrifices correctly, God did not accept their sacrifices. In fact, God's wrath was kindled all the more. If the sacrifices were not done perfectly and not done properly and not done the way God had said them to be done, then there was only more wrath that was kindled. But listen to this. Christ comes on the scene and as the perfect obedient Son, He lifts Himself up upon that cross and He is nailed there and He dies upon that cross as a perfect, perfect sacrifice. And so God the Father on the third day raises His Son up from the grave saying, yes, that resurrection is God saying, in effect, yes, my Son, I receive your sacrifice. I receive your atoning work. It is pleasing to me. No ounce of my wrath is left for your people. No more do I have wrath and anger against them. It is gone. It is gone. It is gone. What did Jesus say at the cross in those last moments? To tell us die. One word, to tell us die. And it means it is finished. Paid for in full. That is glorious. And so the Father raises him up on the third day saying amen. Amen to that. Amen to the sons to tell us die. It is the Father saying amen 
to the Lord Jesus saying, it is finished. And after 40 days of further ministry among his disciples, after being raised from the dead, he then ascends bodily. He goes to the Mount of Olives. His disciples are there. They're watching him. And he ascends into glory. He ascends into heaven. And the Bible tells us that he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. As, he, as Hebrews 12 tells us, he sat down there on that throne and he is seated there in the throne room of heaven. He is seated in heaven right now, reigning as God and as King of the universe, as the Lord of glory. And all things are being put under his feet as, as in subjection to his rule and reign and sovereignty. The book of Isaiah tells us his kingdom will never have an end. And so, the work of Christ is finished. It is finished. And He has been rewarded. He has been exalted. Listen to the words of Daniel 7. And this is again, this is hundreds of years. Again, this is another Old Testament prophet writing hundreds of years before Jesus even came onto the scene. And He says these words in verse... Verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. That's Christ. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, that's the Father, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. You think you're the master of your own destiny? You think you're sovereign over your life? You're a fool. You're a fool to think that, friends. Christ is the master of your destiny. And He is over your life. You know, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm perturbed when pastors will say, and preachers, and I'm a pastor, and, and so I can, I can say from their perspective, I can say this from their perspective. They say things like, you just need to make Jesus Lord of your life. You just need to make Jesus Lord of your life. That's ridiculous. Jesus is Lord of your life. It doesn't matter if you've never even heard His name before. If you are some pagan out in the middle of nowhere, you are under the Lordship of Jesus Christ right now. The question is not, will you make Him that? The question is, will you submit to that? The question is, you are either going to bow the knee today in repentance and faith in the finished work of Christ, or on the day of judgment, the rod of His wrath will break your knees and you will have no other choice but to bow before His throne. That is the question. Will you submit to His authority? And so my friends, I want to say this. This is what you must do to be saved. You must repent and believe the gospel. Not go walk an aisle, not go and talk to a preacher, not go and say anything to a priest, not have an emotional experience, not ask Jesus in your heart, but repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said in Mark 1, 15, repent and believe the gospel. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Two verses later in verse 5, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The book, um, the book of Acts testifies that the Apostle Paul taught that men must have faith in the finished work of Christ and repent. It's those two things you must do. Flee your sin. Flee your self-trust. Flee your confidence. Flee your self-righteousness. Flee your pornography. That's right, you young men and even young women. God sees your internet history, friends. You may delete it. Your girlfriend, your spouse may not see it. God sees it. God keeps a record of it. So repent. Repent. Be zealous and repent. And flee from your hatred. Flee from your self-righteousness. Flee your love of this world and find safe haven in the finished work of Christ. Repentance is a 180. It's turning from sin and turning to the Maker. Turning to God. The Greek word there in the New Testament for repentance is... Um, I can't even remember now. It mean, well, I know what it means. It means to change your mind. Oh, it meant metanoia. That's the Greek word. Um, sorry, I'm still learning Greek, folks. Please have grace with me. But the Greek word there is metanoia. It means change. Meta means change, and noia means minor, your thinking. So you must change your thinking. Change the way you look at this world and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the Greek word used in the New Testament for faith and belief is pistis and pistuo. It means to have a confidence to have a confidence in something. To trust and believe. That is what God requires of you. Believe that He did it. Believe that Christ did the work necessary for your salvation. Stop trying to, to earn a right standing before God by your own performance. And flee to Christ. Look to Christ. And behold His beauty. 
beauty as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Look to Christ for life. That is what you must do. Look, believe. The Bible says, "Forever will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved." The Bible says in in Romans ten eleven that he who believes in him will not be disappointed. In other words, they will die and they will be received into glory. My friends, if you believe the gospel message, here's what will happen. Here's the benefit of believing on Christ. Your sins will be forgiven. Your sins will be washed away. God will forgive you of all of your sins, no matter how heinous, no matter how great they are. And you will be justified. Because Christ's atoning work at the cross purchased forgiveness for God's elect, for God's people. Christ's work is secure, and therefore if you put your trust in His finished work, you'll be saved, you'll be forgiven of your sins. And, and here's the glorious reality. You will be wrapped in the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. God will clothe you in the perfect garments of His righteousness. You will be perfectly righteous in Christ. God will look at you as having lived Jesus' perfect life. God will look at you as if you fulfilled the law, as if you kept every one of those commandments. Because he looked at Christ as if he had broken all of those commandments. That's the exchange of the gospel, dear friends. Christ takes my sin and I get his perfect righteousness. Christ takes my iniquities and I get his absolute perfect righteousness. Believe and you will be forgiven. Jesus told his disciples in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 46, he says, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. You will be forgiven of your sin because Christ's atoning work at the cross is sufficient. And you will be given the righteousness of Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3, he says in verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. This is about righteousness from God. This is gift righteousness. It is a free gift of grace. Believe it. God bless you, sir. It is a free gift of grace. You who are young, believe. You who are young, uh, uh, you who are old, believe. You who are rich, you who are poor, it doesn't matter. Believe upon Christ. He is the Lord for all the peoples. He is the Lord for all the peoples. It does not matter what you have done or what sin you live in. Come to Christ to be cleansed of it. Don't worry about trying to clean up yourself. Come to Christ. He will clean you up. He is offered to you today. The outward call of the gospel goes forth. Christ is at your disposal. God, My friends, God is imminent. God is near to every one of us. He is not far. He's not far away from you. It doesn't matter how much of a vile wretch you are. And trust me, you're worse than you think. You're worse than you think yourself to be. Much worse. I'm worse than I think myself to be. But I know that God's grace is much greater than I think it to be. It is much more beyond my comprehension. As the Apostle Paul says in Acts 17, verse 26, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. God is near to you. Oh, you sinners, God is near to you. Cry out to the Lord of hosts. He is mighty to save. He is mighty to redeem His people from their sins.
Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you who are lost, trust in Christ. And you who are Christians, you who claim to be Christian, you who are believers, genuine believers, I cry out to you this evening, be encouraged, be blessed by the message of the Gospel. By the message of Jesus Christ, may your soul be refreshed through hearing the message of the Gospel. Hey, Brother John, could you come over here for a second? Thank you. I don't know this guy all too well, the guy over there yep. talking to another. Can you just be sure that yep. it's a gospel conversation? Because yep. this guy seems like he's seeking. Thank you. I can trust you to moderate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dear friends, if you're a Christian, be encouraged and preach this gospel. Live upon this gospel day after day after day. Feed on it. It is your manna from heaven. It is all you have to sustain you. And if you're not living on the gospel, my friends, my dear brethren, you will suffer greatly and you will be stripped of much of much joy that you can experience in Christ. And so I would like to say also I'd like to address those of you here who claim to be Christians but you are hypocrites as I myself was for eight years. I want to address you false converts, you sons and daughters of hell. I want to address you. I care for you enough to tell you this. I want to tell you the truth. And I'm going to begin by saying this. Jesus says in Matthew 7, in verse 16, He says, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. My friends, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, I want to ask you this simple question. Do you bear good fruit? That is the question. The book of 1 John tells us that the one who is born of God practices righteousness. I'm not asking, are you perfect? No one is perfect. I'm imperfect. I sin. But I want to ask you, does your life reflect a life that has been redeemed by the grace of God? Do you walk in obedience to the Word of Jesus Christ? Are you walking in obedience to the commands of Jesus Christ? Not out of, not out of a sense of, well, I've got to do this to be saved. Out of a sense of gratitude. Out of a sense of love for His, His beauty and His power and His gospel message. And out of, out of gratefulness for what He has done for you. Do you live in obedience to Christ? Do you bear fruit? Do you bear good fruit? Or do you bear bad fruit? Are you a hypocrite? Are you addicted to sin? And you think yourself to be saved? Are you a drunkard? Are you sexually immoral and perverse? Do you love to, do you love to have entertainment in things that God hates? Do you love to watch things on television? To watch movies? To listen to music? You know God detests. You know it is disgusting in His eyes. Yet you find it to be entertaining. For if that is you, if that is your case, you are not a Christian. I don't care whether you had an emotional experience in a church or not, or a preacher told you you're a Christian, and a preacher really shouldn't be going around telling anyone they're Christian. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Or perhaps maybe someone you thought was religious told you you were a Christian. Or maybe because you got baptized and you are raised in church or whatever, or you know your parents are Christians, so you're a Christian. That doesn't work like that. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is a personal, radical, life-changing thing that happens to someone. Myself, I'm actually a perfect illustration of it in the sense of, not in the good way though. Because my life, for eight years, I lived in total rebellion to the commandments of God. I cared nothing about the things of God. I couldn't care less about prayer or studying the Bible or, or understanding God's truth. I was addicted to pornography. I was a drunkard. 
did sexually immoral things and I thought because I prayed the prayer I asked Jesus into my heart right I was a Christian right I believed didn't I no I did not believe I was a hypocrite I had a belief that was intellectual but it never changed my life. It was not a life-changing, genuine belief in the gospel. And my friends, if you think you can say you're a Christian and just live like everyone else in this world, you are a hypocrite. You're lying to yourself, and on the day of judgment, you will have the most terrifying words pronounced over you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. Who did Jesus say the most harshest of words to. Who was Jesus most harsh with? It was the religious people who thought themselves to be actually right with God, but inwardly they were full of dead men's bones. It was the people who said, we know God, we know, we know the Creator, we're actually God's people, and they were hypocrites and they lived in disobedience to His commands, and they were lost eternally. Friends, do you know Christ? Truly, are you, have you been born again? I don't want to know about some experience you've had. I want to know, are you today, are you right now, walking in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and submission to the will of God? Are you walking in that because you desire to do so? You desire to please the One who redeemed your soul. Don't hear me saying this because I'm not. Do not hear me saying, well, you've got to work out your salvation. You've got to do things to be saved. You've got to do works to be saved. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. But the results of salvation, the result of being saved by grace is that you will walk in obedience. You will walk in holiness. You will walk in purity. You will not be a hypocrite. God saves His people from hypocrisy. Works are not the cause of salvation, but works are the result of salvation. The works that we produce, the deeds that we do are results of what God has done in us. Namely, He has given us faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. My friends, and I, I have to challenge you this because we live in a nation, we're in the Bible Belt. I see it all the time. We're in the Bible Belt. We're in, this place is just steeped in Christianity. Well, supposedly, it's a false apostate Christianity. It's an easy believism. If you're in a church or you go to a church where they make salvation like this, just close your eyes, bow your head, and anybody raise their hand, come on down. They manipulate people. That's not a gospel preaching church. That's a man-centered church. That's a man-centered gospel. The true gospel of Jesus Christ exalts Christ and abases the pride and will of man. The will which is bound only to sin. Sin and more sin. Friends, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. Look at your life. Be introspective for a moment. Look at yourself. And say, have I come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 13.5. Paul challenges the Corinthians. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Look at your life. My friends, people, people's lives, people have lost their souls over this damnable heresy that you can just say you're a Christian and it doesn't matter how you lived because one saved, always saved, right? Well, I want to say I affirm the doctrine of perseverance of the saints that once someone is saved, they'll always be saved. But the nature of salvation produces obedience. Someone who has been genuinely saved by God's grace will walk in obedience to Christ. And they will be freed from idolatry. That very sin which we began looking at some time ago in Romans 1. They will be freed from being slave to sin and a slave to idolatry. Instead, as the text reads in verse 25 of Romans 1, it says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Instead, they will be freed from that and they'd be able to worship the Creator rather than the creature. They're, they will be able to worship the Almighty in true righteousness and holiness. That is the nature of salvation. God restores the fellowship which was broken in the garden. He restores that which the enemy destroyed and broke.
If you're lost, come to Jesus Christ to be saved. Matthew 11 tells us, Jesus spoke these words. He said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And you, my dear fellow Christians, be encouraged and be blessed this very evening. Recall and meditate upon the message of the cross. Recall the glorious gospel and feed upon it daily. And lastly, you who are false Christians, you who say you're Christians but you're really hypocrites, cry out to God this very evening. Renounce such a false apostate Christianity. Flee your rebellion. Flee your hypocrisy. And look to Christ. Look to Christ for eternal life. For He will save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. So we've seen here in Romans 1, verses 24 and 25, that there comes a point when sinful mankind reject the Lord God, reject the Gospel, reject Christ, reject the truth of Scripture, that God will give them up over, over to that so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And they eventually fall into blatant idolatry, worshiping the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And that ultimately leads me to what I want to say in these closing moments. My friends, as I said at the beginning, this is all to the end that God might be glorified. This is all to the end that God might be exalted. That He might be praised. This is all for the glory of God. God has designed and so ordered salvation to bring glory and honor and praise and worship to His holy name. It's all for Him. So therefore, give God the glory by coming to Him through Jesus Christ. Give God the glory for the great things that He has done. Look to the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness. through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36 <coughs> verse 22 God promised the coming Savior who would inaugurate the new covenant well he promised specifically the new covenant in verse 22 he says therefore say to the house of Israel thus says the Lord God it is not for your sake O house of Israel that I'm about to act but for my holy name my friends, that is the chief end to which God works all things, to bring His holy name glory, to bring honor and praise to Himself. And so, bring God glory. Glorify the Lord. Magnify His wondrous name. Give glory to the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was slain. Who was slain. He's worthy to receive worship and exaltation. Listen to the words of Revelation 5, verse 12. It says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Verse 13, To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. That is the chief end of all things and for the gospel message. To bring God glory. Indeed. Hallelujah to the Lord who saves His people with His mighty right hand. Now in these closing moments, I want to leave off with what Paul says in the book of Romans as we're, as we're looking at here in Romans 1. He says just 10 chapters later in chapter 11, he says these words. Verse 34, For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor, or who was first given to him, that it might be paid back to him again. For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, to God be the glory through Christ. Amen. And amen.